Hallelujah. Who's ready to praise God tonight? Hallelujah. Let's do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sort this out. One moment. A hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. Hallelujah With everything inside of me I raise a hallelujah I will watch the darkness flee I raise a hallelujah In the middle of the mystery I raise a hallelujah Fear you lost your hold on me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roll Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roll up from the ashes. Hope will arise, death is defeated, the king is alive. Yes, he's alive. Sing a little louder. Hallelujah. I raise a 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 hallelujah. I raise
you tonight lord god and we thank you for this opportunity to once again come together as brethren yes and just to worship your name lord you are awesome in this place and father we thank you for what you're about to do in our lives father we thank you lord for what you're doing tonight in jesus name amen praise god before you sit down please go and say hello to someone we'll be back in a few moments praise the lord always is always a good time so praise the lord it's going to be great all right, ICFM, 8th to the 10th of June. We are hosting it here. It's going to be awesome. So praise God. And uh, if you've never been to an ICFM, you're in for a real treat. Praise God. Whenever you finish an ICFM conference, you come away and you're just, you're just, bzzz, and uh, it's going to be excellent. So uh, praise God. We're looking forward to that. We're hosting. So we're going to be serving here in the house, which is um, doubly good. And it's going to be excellent. So praise God. That's, uh, that's coming up real fast. All right, uh, do you want to do the youth and the Passover notice? Yeah, you're, all, you're good, praise the Lord. So you've got this youth on Friday. Woo! And also on the 3rd of April, we've got Passover here. So uh, that's going to be on the Saturday, I believe. 3rd of April, Saturday. And so instead of our fellowship night, we are Passovering. All right, so we are Passovering, okay? So we're going to be here, I think, I believe Saturday night. Then we've got our Sunday morning service then that's it for, for church that week so that's going to be excellent so praise the lord i uh, look forward to that that's going to be great excellent all right it's time for our tithes and offerings yeah. all right turn with me to acts 3 acts 3 praise the lord all right acts 3 and verse 1 it says now peter and john went up together at the temple at the hour of of prayer the ninth hour and a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple which is called beautiful to ask alms from those who entered the temple you know what's quite interesting when we read stuff like this you know we get to, we're going to get to meet these people how cool is that eh? man you're the guy we read about <laughs> far out man we read we read you 
Pastor Barry read you heaps during the tithes and offerings message. So which is called beautiful uh, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. And who's seen Peter and John about to go into the temple asking for alms, fixed his eyes on him with John and Peter said, look at us. So he gave them the, his attention expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So leaping up, he stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he who sat begging arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So praise the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, what I, uh, I got a revelation of the scripture here uh, a few years back. And um, what I discovered is that uh, if we go back to chapter 2 and verse 40, uh, 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and the breaking of bread and prayers, and the fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. And so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And what we see here is that their giving had some sort of spiritual impact on the apostles. And uh, I remember um, uh, heading over to um, India. Uh, if, you, if you hand in a one New Zealand dollar, in the, uh, you get um, 33, this is at the time we were there, you get 33 um, rupees back. And so if you went over there with 10 bucks, you get 330 rupees back. There was an exchange of currency. And what we see here is that, uh, what the Lord showed me that, um, a few years back, is that there was an exchange of currency here. They, they gave out of their hearts as, as they purposed in their heart. And this is, it wasn't like God said, you must sell all your possessions because we can read that and think, oh, to get to this level, do I have to sell all my possessions? It was something that they wanted to do. It was something that was uh, 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 divinely inspired. So they sold all their possessions and goods and divided among all as anyone had need. And there was an exchange in currency. The, the anointing went up. And so when the apostles entered the, the, into the temple, nothing was impossible. Amen? So praise the Lord. When you give, it, it's a spiritual thing. It's not just a, a physical thing you have to... Ob under obligation it, it is a, a spiritual thing and we give as we purpose in our hearts amen praise the lord let's pray thank you lord father we just thank you for this time we thank you for this opportunity to give you're good in this place you're good over our finances and father i thank you for increase this year hallelujah i thank you for more people coming out of debt this year in jesus name we thank you for freehold houses freehold businesses cars freehold we owe no man nothing but to love them in Jesus name and Father I just speak it right now in Jesus name I thank you for it in Jesus name and all the people say Amen thank you thank you ushers good on you son don't stop at our family keep going <laughs> praise the Lord excellent very good all right we'll have the worship team back uh kids will release you now have an awesome time tonight praise god we will see you afterwards praise the lord let's wish the lord together before we receive the word excellent
come to you tonight, Father. Enter into your presence by the way you made, by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The access into your presence, into your throne room. to the heavens Your faithfulness stretches to the sky Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains Yeah your justice flows like the ocean's tide. Your love, your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountain. Yeah. Your justice falls like the ocean side. And I will lift my voice to worship you, my I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You love one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I will lift my voice. To worship you, my King, and I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings, and I will lift my voice and worship you, my King. I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness. Stretches to the skies. Your righteousness, it's like the mighty mountains. Yeah. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. I will lift, lift my voice. Worship you, my King, and I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. I will lift and I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the skies Your righteousness is like
like the mighty mountains, yeah. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. It's your love, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, your goodness, your mercy that endures forever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, our God. Thank you. the word at the beginning one with God the Lord most high your hidden glory in creation and now revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my what a powerful name it is, nothing can pass to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Your name, Jesus. We lift up your name, Jesus. Death could not, the death could not hold you. The veil saw before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again you have no rival you have no equal now and forever God you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the glory yours is the name above all names what a powerful name it is what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death cannot hold you, the veil's all before you, silence the boast of sin and grace the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again you have no rival you have no equal now and forever god you reign your sister kingdom Yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. 
name is. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Jesus. No other name like Jesus. Jesus. Our Savior. Emmanuel. Hallelujah.
just keep that attitude of worship right now I just want to read something to you I believe there may be some people in here that are, are facing some things in their, their life and their situation and circumstances right now some challenges crisis is normal to life Dr. Cole I just want to read something to you. It says, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. This comes from 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan. Now that word messenger is an angel. To buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, something that I've picked up here recently is, is this. That my grace is sufficient for you and sometimes I think as believers we take this this verse and we kind of think well God's grace is, is, is enough for me to tolerate this to tolerate this thing that's bugging me tolerate this thing that's kind of this crisis in my life What I've noticed about this, this passage here is that God was saying that my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. See, grace came to us when we received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. In our weak state, in our weak form. But now he's saying, you're not weak anymore. Because you've been made perfect in my strength. So you don't have to, I don't know why you're begging me to take this thing away. 
because my strength is now in you. You handle it. You handle it. My grace, my half has been done. My job here is finished. It was finished on the cross. But now the ball is in your court. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. ears to hear, let let them hear. Hear what he's saying. here and you heard it you received it in your heart I want you to respond right now hallelujah I believe the anointing here is for you my grace is sufficient for you praise God praise God I thank you for right now in Jesus name <laughs> my grace is oh, oh. my grace is sufficient for you I thank you for it right now in the name
praise your name. Praise your name. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your presence here, Lord. We ask for an increase of you, Father, in Jesus' name. Come. Speak to us as we break open the bread of life. Come and interrupt this meeting. But your will be done, your kingdom come tonight. In Jesus' name. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. from Luke 19 and verse 41 it says now as he drew near he saw the city this is Jerusalem he being Jesus and he wept over it saying if if you had known even you especially in this your day 
the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave you in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. If I knew that Jesus was coming on a bus and I knew that at the bus stop that he would be coming at, and I, but I didn't know the, the hour or the time, I'd be watching that bus stop like a hawk. There's been instances ever since I've been in this house where a word of the Lord has come for some people but they haven't been here to receive them and they missed their time of visitation you know what Jesus weeps Jesus weeps My challenge to you is keep your eyes and your ears and your hearts open. Look for a reason to be in the presence of God. Get hungry for it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Don't miss your time of visitation. Become accustomed to his presence. Draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for right now in Jesus' name. You are good, your mercies endure forever. Thank you for your word, it is health and life to us, and keeping over there is great reward. Thank you for a spirit of revelation and understanding tonight in Jesus' name. Thank you that it comes alive inside of us in your glorious name Lord in your name in Jesus name amen and amen praise the Lord praise the Lord excellent thank you team very good praise the Lord changing microphones if you're still receiving from the Lord it's okay just stay on the floor it's all good remember I've stayed on the floor many a times during uh, whoever was preaching they had to just step over me <laughs> praise god all right we're up to different spirit part three a different spirit part three now if you've got your bibles let's turn to numbers 14 and verse 20 numbers 14 and verse 20 now i'm probably going to refrain from um asking alex to hand out bibles in the night service because the night service is for believers you should be here to be prepared ready to receive Praise the Lord. Should be ready to receive. Remember, I, uh, I knew a, a friend who made the, the SAS, the Secret Army Service, and they said they, they, their sergeants, they come in, busting into their cabins and yelling and screaming at them to make their beds. They just, you have to make them. Otherwise, if you don't make them, you're not meant to be in this, in this place. So be prepared. Bring pens, papers, ready to receive. Praise the Lord. Uh, so I realize that some people may be audible learners, and that's cool. But get it in on the inside of you somehow. All right, Numbers 14 and verse 20. And then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but as truly as I live, the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Praise God. Because all these men have seen my glory in the signs in which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and now have put me to the test now these ten times, and have not heeded my voice, then certainly they shall not see the land for which I swore to their fathers. Nor shall any of those who reject, rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him, has followed me fully, I will bring him to the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. It. 
You know what was stink for Caleb here and Joshua, because they were the only two out of all of Israel that entered into the promised land, is that they still, because of their peers, had to, to march around the desert for 40 years. That sucks. That really stinks. It wasn't like he says, okay, uh, Joshua and Caleb, you guys can go. <laughs> you guys can go. You guys get out into the wilderness 40 years. You're in detention. <laughs> yeah, he's a bit more gracious, uh, I suppose. <laughs> but what I, well, it's quite interesting. I've I've read this, um, read this Bible from page, cover to cover, well, not this one, but the Bible. And um, and what what I learned from here is that uh, is God's gracious mercy on Israel. He refused to wash his hands clean from wayward Israel. And there is a word for that. There's a Hebrew word called kased. It's H-A-S-E-D, kased. It's pronounced kased. And it's, it's, it's persistent and consistent refusal to wash his hands free from wayward Israel. He just refused to let them go. It's awesome. So what we see here is that, is that uh, uh, God is displeased with all the nation of Israel except for two guys, Caleb and Joshua. And he says this of Caleb, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him, has followed me fully, and I'll bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. And so the King James Version here says, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him. His spirit was different to others. It was another spirit. Um, the contemporary English Version says, but my servant Caleb isn't like the others. He isn't like the others. And the message says this, but my servant Caleb, this is a different story. He has a different spirit. He follows me passionately. Now in each of those translations there, God says, this is my servant, Caleb. He is my servant, Caleb. And that word servant in the Hebrew is the word abed, abed, E-B-E-D, e abed. It's pronounced abed. And that means bond servant or bound on all sides. A bond servant, he is bound on all sides. And he could be, uh, this, this word here is used for servants or slaves that could be bought with money. Um, but Abed was used as a mark of humility and courtesy. For instance, uh, a praying uh, in the Old Testament here, pass not away, I pray thee from thy servant. So it was a mark of, of courtesy or, or humility. And so Caleb served the Lord and he was bound to him by choice on all sides. And that's powerful, man. Bound to God. No matter what happens, Lord, I'm yours. I will follow you wholly. And then we looked at Daniel. Daniel was different. And what differentiated him from all the others is that he had an excellent spirit. His spirit was excellent. And the word excellent means to excel, to surpass, and to glow in the Hebrew. I like that, to glow. Because it's quite interesting, when you really think about it, the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters covers the seas. And, and, and a, a remnant or a definition of the word glory is, is a, 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 like a glow, it's like a cloud. It's his presence. And, um, and we know that from, from Scripture is that God is building His glorious church. So how would the world know? I believe it's from His glorious church that He might present her to Himself a glorious church. And so the glorious ch the church needs to be glorified. The church needs to glow. And we therefore need to have an excellent spirit. Amen. Praise God. This stuff works, man. I can tell you right now from my own testimony. This stuff works. God is good. And you can glow. You're, you can look awesome to your bosses and be promoted very quickly. Put your second in command. Remember, I was standing there in an assembly one time, second in command to my principal. I was thinking, man, this is like Joseph. <laughs> man, I, I wasn't even qualified looking at my, you know, I could have studied more. I was challenged by Pastor Robert Owens, actually. Yeah, he challenged me to get my master's degree. And I'm like, mm. But I knew that uh, on the inside here that education was, was, was just a temporary seasonal thing. 
But um, yeah, good training ground. It was definitely a good training ground. I mean, I've learned lots of things in, in my teaching. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And so Daniel's uh, spirit, it was an excellent spirit. And that's what differentiated him from all the others is that he w had an excellent spirit. And what made him excellent also is that he refused the king's delicacies. Now Daniel is an excellent picture of how we should be here in the world. Because we're, we're, we're not of the world, but we're in it. And we're surrounded by it. We're peppered by the world in the week. We're not, it's not like we have church every day. Praise God, maybe we will eventually. I think when revival hits, we're just going to be here day in and day out. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> like the, uh, the Acts church, they, they continue daily breaking bread and they just met. Well, we've got ICFM coming up, so praise the Lord, that's going to be awesome. And so, uh, uh, but what, what we see here with Daniel is that, that he was not uh, of Babylon, but he was in it. And what stopped Babylon from getting on on the inside of him is that he sanctified himself. He said no to some things. The king's delicacies, for instance. And the, and the guy, the chef says, look, he says, look, I need to look after you. If you look like you're, you're flailing, if you look like you're, you're becoming weak, then I'm, I'm a dead man. You have to eat this stuff. And he says, look, just give us, let's give us vegetables and test it. Come back next week and see, you know, see if that we're, we're, we're not, not as good as all the others. And like his, his, his appearance was great. He, looks, he was strong him and his companions and so he was fine he was, he was able to sanctify himself and so we need to uh, as, as believers here in this world we need to say no to some things we need to sanctify ourselves from some things we don't want the world to get on the inside of us there's some things that we need to say no to and let's uphold an excellent spirit amen praise the Lord praise the Lord so he refused the king's delicacies and so he sanctified himself and he chose to have an excellent spirit. Therefore, he was promoted above his peers. And God has graced you to prosper. Wherever you put your hands to, you can prosper. Isn't that cool? Whatever you put your hands to, you prosper. Therefore, it's our kind of responsibility to walk in that excellence. We need to surpass. We need to excel. You need to glow. It's a responsibility be put into your hands amen all right so that's daniel so uh, caleb was differentiated because he trusted god uh, daniel was differentiated because he had an excellent spirit now let's look at another example here let's go to first samuel 17 this is probably um, one of the most famous of all old testament passages but there's still things that we can learn from it amen you can never kind of doesn't matter how many times we read a, a, a an instance or a, a happening here in the in the Bible, we can still learn. Lots of things we can learn. That's the beauty of the, of the word. All right, First Samuel seventeen verses one it says, "Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and were gathered at Socar, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Socar and Azekar." And Ephes Adamim and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they camped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the battle array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and the Israel stood on the mountain on the other side and the valley between them. Now uh, I was listening to Andrew Womack. He said he's been to the valley of Elah and, and those that are going to Israel in 2023, maybe we might get to go and, go and see that as well, which would be pretty cool. But he said the place was huge. The valley is actually quite massive. And like the, the Philistines would have to stand miles away almost. And, and then you've got the Israelites that are you know, miles away on this side. And so uh, this place is, is quite massive. When I read the story, it reminds me, um, uh, back in my youth days, we used to have this game on camp. We had about uh, maybe 200 kids, which I was one of them, uh, go to a place called... Um, uh, our rancho camp down in um, Waikanae um, in uh, Wellington, it's near Wellington, so Paraparaumu. And uh, there was this game, and, and they, 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 split, they split the whole camp up. So you had 100 kids standing on this, this hill over here, and 100 kids standing on this hill over here. And um, we would wear one color 
string on this uh, on our hands to signify that we're a part of this team. So we'd ha maybe have a green string, and this team over here would have a red string. And the way that you would uh, combat or battle is that you would tackle the, your opposing person and um, uh, and wrestle them, and you've got to rip the string off. It's just a woolen string, like you know what you knit with. So it's easy just to. So you you kind of you know your hand to hand combat kind of thing. It was it was my favourite game of all time. And uh, they changed it to Braveheart because that's what it looked like. There's a group of guys on this hill and a group of guys on this hill and they just go Rah! down into the valley and they rumble. <laughs> it was awesome. So when I became a youth leader here, guess what we played? <laughs> Went over to Laurie Hall Park. It's quite interesting. Split our guys up into, into two teams. And just before we're about to get, get into it, get into a, a big, big fist fight almost, a police car comes rolling up. So I'm used to the police because they always pulled us over when we were youth, youth pastors. Wind down the window and they go, hey, how's it going? What's going on here? And I said, oh, uh, my, name's, my name's Barry. I'm, I'm the youth pastor of Raymond Family Church and this is our youth group. Oh, youth group. Okay, sweet. See you later. <laughs> if they came any time after that, it would have looked like we we're having this big fist fight <laughs> rolling through the gardens and, and man, it was awesome. And... Um, Praise the Lord. I remember we were, we were guarding the safe zone over here in, in Milton. He was, a, he was a youth at this stage. Not anymore. But, uh, <laughs> he, came, he came strolling down. There was five of us guarding the safe zone. And I was thinking, and I was thinking Milton's coming by himself. And he's five, he's five versus one. And I was thinking, surely this is a trap. Surely this is an ambush and there's going to be a whole bunch of guys. Says, well, it wasn't even. He just thought he just decided to take all five of us on. I was like, what? <laughs> Let's deal to him and <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> that was awesome. So anyway, back to the Valley of Elah. So we've got a, a, a mountain of, of, of the Israelites here. And, the, and, the, and on the other side, we've got the mountain um, full of Philistines. And so we hear uh, in verse 3, the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. So basically, uh, he was about nine foot three, I believe. Guy was huge. No one here in the world is nine foot three. Now, uh, it's rumored that uh, uh, these guys were, were descendants from the Nephilims. Um, if you read your Bible in the Old, Old Testament, um, angels, the fallen angels came down and, and had sexual intercourse with women and they gave birth to giants. Giants were like massive men. They had to be eradicated from the earth. God, had, God said, these, these guys need to go. Uh, interestingly, some people thought that in Jericho, these guys were, were descendants of Nephilim as well. Um, the 10 spies says, we are locusts to these men. These men, uh, we believe, are descendants from these giants. And so uh, uh, they believe that, that, that Goliath from Gath, nine and a half foot man, was, was, was huge. And it's quite interesting. I've been watching these documentaries and... Um, uh, even like other cultures who, who don't have this kind of biblical understanding, when, they, when you go back into their history and their ancient history, there is, they draw these parallels to the Bible. They talk about these giants that roamed the earth. They talk about the great flood. They talk about these kind of different parallels. It's quite interesting, when I took Te Reo Māori in, uh, in my teaching degree, um, uh, we had w Wallace Weehongi. Does anyone know Wallace Weehongi? He was around, he was an old komatua from, from Kaikui, heading out that way. Uh, so Wallace Weehong used to teach us uh, about in Māori tikanga that back in the day, they said that, that about 2,000 years ago, there was a white dove that was sacrificed behind a, a, a marae that, um, that cleansed everybody's sins. He drew this parallel. It was, it was quite interesting, this parallel. He was Mormon anyway. <laughs> so he was kind of making references there. But there are these parallels. If you go back, and people that kind of keep their history, peoples that keep their history, there are these parallels that obviously comes back to the truth. And, they, and there's uh, this people, I think they're called the Ashaze people, from, from, they're Red Indians. Back in their history, they talk about the Great Flood. And they also talk about the giants. They were giant men. And so here, here we've got Gath. Gath standing nine, nine foot three. Uh, had a bronze helmet on his head, um, and he was armed 
with a coat of mail that weigh the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze and I've done some research and that's about 35 kgs so 35 kgs just whoa. so if he wasn't heavy enough <laughs> plus 35 kgs this guy was a beast and he had a bronze armor on his legs and bronze javelin between his shoulders and now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels and a shield bearer went before him so he had a guy that carried his shield then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them why have you come out to line for battle am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me and if he is able to fight with me and kill me then we will be your servants but if I prevail against him and kill him then you shall be our servants and serve us and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of the Ephra Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old and advanced in years in the days of Saul. And the three older sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul into battle. And the name of his three sons who went to battle were Eliab the firstborn next to him was Abinadab and then the third was Shammah and David was the youngest and the three oldest follow Saul and David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem and the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days morning and evening 40 days one thing you've got to admire about Goliath was his persistence turned up for work every day for 40 days to issue a challenge and you would think about day 39 and thinking man this ain't this ain't happening <laughs> this ain't happening and so for 40 days he issued this challenge and so uh jesse said to his son david take now for your brothers this ephah of this dried grain and these 10 loaves and run to your brothers at camp and carrying these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fear and bring, bring back news of them. Now Saul and they, uh, and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper and took those things and went to Jesse, uh, went as Jesse had commanded them. And he came to the camp where the army was going out to the fight and shouting for the battle. And Israel and Philistines had drawn up in a battle array. And then David left the supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army and greeted his brothers. And then he was talking with them. There was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them this time. Now David heard them, heard the challenge. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him who were dreadfully afraid. And see them so the men of Israel said have you seen this man who has come up surely he has come up to defy Israel and it shall be that the man who kills him the king will enrich with great riches and give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying what what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and what what should be done for the man who takes away this reproach from Israel? You mean that there is a reward? Are you kidding me? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? What we see here is is is, is David's response differentiated him from the rest of Israel. David now has a different spirit. He hears this challenge. He's a boy. He's a 17-year-old. I don't know if he's 17, probably. <laughs> but he's sitting there, he goes, what? Are you kidding me? And he's looking at his, his, his nation, trembling with fear, running back. Where's the king? What is wrong with you people? Why are you running? And so his, his, his reply here differentiated him from all else, made him different. 
And what, you, and what we see here in his response is awesome. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Now, this, the circumcision, if you don't know what circumcision, uh, it was a mark of the covenant. It was an Abrahamic covenant. So every time a man relieved himself, he was reminded of his, the covenant that was made with God. It was a blood covenant. And the Philistines were uncircumcised, therefore they had no place of agreement with God. They were on their own. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Shouting at us like this. Shouting at God. And he says, so he says, who, who is this, this that he should defy the armies of the living God? Armies of the living God. Our God lives. It distinguishes us from their lifeless idols. They have no God. They are idols of the heathen. And he was absolutely convinced that no matter what size the man is, he stands no chance against the armies of God. He stands no chance against an all-powerful Almighty God. Verse 27. And the people answered him and said, and the man is saying, so it shall be done for the man who kills him. But Eliab gets hacked off. So now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, Eliab's anger was aroused against David. He says, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? You know, if you, if you, differentiated, if you have a differentiated spirit, if you have a different spirit about, about you, it will draw criticism and persecution. Not even from the world, from other Christians. even from those who are supposed to be believers. There is this thing called the tall poppy syndrome. Who here has heard of the tall poppy syndrome? And basically, this is it by definition. It's people that think too highly of themselves uh, uh, that it's their duty to try and cut you down to their level. So if you kind of stick your head up above all the other poppies, they will cut you down and criticize you until they bring you down to their level. And the Pharisees did the same to, or tried to do the same to Jesus. Who do you think you are? We have thousands of years of tradition and religion here. We are founded here. Who do you think you are? And they ridiculed him. They try to try to catch him out. And so we, what we see here is that David, David's spirit was differentiated. He goes, oh man, this disgusting shameful person is, is speaking against God and speaking against us why hasn't anyone taken them out already so David replies to his brother and says what have I done now is there not a cause so he turned from him and turned to another and said the same thing and these people answered him as the first ones did now when the words of David spoke were heard they reported them to Saul and he sent for him and David said to Saul let no one no man's heart fail because of him your servant will go and fight this Philistine no one else here is going to do it. I'll do it. Let me go. Let me go. And so what we see here is that Saul said to David, look, you, <laughs> you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for, for you, you're a youth. You're a young guy. And he's been a man of war from his youth. Obviously, uh, uh, Saul has forgotten some things too. He looked on the outward appearance and says, look, I'm looking at you right now and, and you, man, I've got some warriors out here who've killed many. There's lots of blood on their hands. You've, you've done nothing. You're just a shepherd boy. He's looking at the outside. He's looking at the outward appearance. And so what we see here in verse 33 and, and Saul said to, uh, verse 34 and David said to Saul but your servant used to keep his father's sheep and whenever a lion or a bear came to took a lamb out from the flock 
I went out after it and I struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose again against me, I caught it by its bed and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both a lion and a bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will just be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. You can almost see David's eyes. He just locked onto the king. <laughs> I can't believe I have to say this. That same God who delivered me from those animals, the lion and the bear, the Lord delivered me from them. And he's going to, just, he's going to carry on delivering me. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Let me go. So Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Praise the Lord. Right, jump down to verse 38. So Saul clothed David with his armor and he put on the bronze helmet on his head. And he also clothed him with a coat of mail. And David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk. <laughs> for uh, he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk in these. For I have not tested them. So David took them off. It's quite interesting. Uh, before Pastor Colin left here, one of the word of the Lord he said to me was that you cannot wear my armor. Don't even try to wear my armor. And that was one of the most awesomest things that he could say to me. He says, you, you can't be me. And uh, I've walked with some people who try to wear somebody else's armor. I remember we had this awesome uh, uh, young guy here, and, and he, he came from, you know, he was a bit of a grungy dude, but a little bit rugged. But uh, uh, when he came to know the things of the Lord, there was, he made some significant changes. You know, he, 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 uh, and I believe he probably made too much. He, he kind of conformed himself to what people thought was a Christian, a nice Christian young man. But it wasn't him. When, when, when people kind of transform themselves to something that they're not, I think there's a danger in that. You can't, you can't sustain that kind of life and walk with God. God didn't call you to be, God hadn't called me to be Pastor Colin. He called me to be under him, which I am eternally grateful for. Praise the Lord. But he called me to be me. And he's called you to be you. He hasn't called you to be somebody else. You cannot wear somebody else's armor. If you, if you fight with a sling and some stones, then you fight with a sling and some stones. If you fight with armor and a spear and a shield, then you fight with an armor, spear and a shield. Be you. God will make you the better, a better you. You will go through some changes. Praise the Lord. He'll make you who, to whom you, he originally created you to be after he's you know, cut away all the world and stuff. But be who you are. Amen? I remember, uh, <laughs> remember when I came into the Lord and, I, and you know, just sitting under, sitting under God, I realized that the stuff I was listening to wasn't good. I had like Snoop Dogg and Tupac and the Dog Pound. I listened to some pretty hard out gangster rap and a lot of it was profane. A lot of it had some, you know, sexual connotations and, and that kind of stuff. And I knew that that stuff had to go. So I, I bagged it all up. I, had this, I remember the day, the big rubbish bag of stuff, posters and, and all that kind of stuff. This was early on in my walk. It wasn't last week, just in case you guys were wondering. <laughs> and so out it, out it went. But as a young guy, I'm sitting there and I've got nothing in my room now to, that, you know, and so, uh, you know, my, my stepmother at the time, she, uh, with all good intentions, said, here, why don't you listen to this Michael W. Smith tape? So I put that on, I'm listening to Michael W. Smith, and I'm thinking, I'm going from Tupac and Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre to now Michael W. Smith. And Michael W. Smith's a great guy, don't, don't get me wrong, but it's not my suit of armor. <laughs> it's not who I fight with. So I prayed. I said, Lord, you've got to give me something. And I think within either a day or even it could have possibly been that night, Cade Wilson, who uh, good brother, um, he lived next door. He comes over and goes, oh, do you want to listen to this? And he gave me my first ever Christian rap tape. Called, they were called Disciples of Christ. And um, listen to it, they're a little bit cheesy, 
But what it was is that it got me, uh, got me looking for it now. I was thinking, man, there, there are some things that are suited for, for me. And so uh, now I've got so many, uh, uh, I've got like lists of, of Christian rap stuff on, on my Spotify that I, I just love listening to because that's who I am. This is how I'm, I've designed. This is who I, how I've been created. This is, what, this is the way I am. So God doesn't, uh, when he brings you and sanctifies you, it doesn't mean that he throws the bar- baby out with the bathwater. He kind of sanctifies it and uses the gifts in the way and the things that you've been created to glorify him. Wear your suit of armor. Wear, fight with the way that you fight. God has created you to be you. You can't be somebody else. And it's a shame when people fall away because they can't live up to this this expectation. There's many people that have tried to put on Saul's armor and try to go on out there and fight and they're stumbling around. What are you doing? God's created you to be you. Amen? That was completely Holy Spirit. It's gone way off topic there, but um, anyway. So, don't wear my armor. Don't wear my armor. And so David took it off. He says, look, I can't fight with this. So David took it off. Verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag. Now, many people have kind of thought about, why did he choose five? He knew he was going to sling them with with one he wasn't going to miss there Colin he wasn't going to miss but um, I've, I've seen one of these slings in action and, um, uh, and uh, I've seen a photo of an Arab guy slinging the, the slings are actually quite amazing they're quite, probably about maybe a couple of meters like this and, they're, and they're, they're picking up so much velocity from a sling and like uh, when you release those things those things are like bullets just <laughs> So he chose some smooth ones so because of the flight. If you pick it, like for instance, if you're skimming, uh, if you're skimming stones across a lake, you choose smooth ones because of the, um, the, the less friction. Uh, and it's the same thing. When you, when you fling a, a smooth stone, it, it picks up its velocity, maximum velocity. So he chose five smooth ones for a sling in, the, in his hand. And I believe that the other four is probably for um, Goliath's family. Let's go. I'll cheat. I don't just choose you. I choose. Where's your family? Bring your brothers out as well. Let's go. <laughs> Bring the whole lot out. So who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? Who is this man? So he chooses five smooth stones from the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch, which he had, and a sling was in his hand. And he drew near the Philistine. That's what I lo- love about David. David, he just went, let's get this over and done with. He didn't kind of have to prepare himself or think, oh, Jesus, I thank you, Father, giving me strength. He went out. He goes, let's go. Where is he? There he is. Went out, met him. Went out after him. So the first thing came in beginning to draw near to David, and the the man who bore the shield went before him. So there was two guys. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. (laughs) For he was a youth. He was ruddy. And he was good looking. You know, the, the word, the, the word he was, this guy was a pretty boy. He was a good looking young man. Hey, how's it going? I'm going to be fighting you today. And, uh, and, and this really kind of disgusted Goliath. He goes, out of all those warriors out there, you send, am I a dog? <laughs> Did you send this boy out? And uh, what I love about God is God, he goes, look, I, if you're going to mock me, if you're going to defy my armies who I've protected, who I, I've shown my wonders to against Egypt and pulled them out of here, they're going to send the least of Israel to take you down. I don't have to use, use a mighty warrior that they, they say it's from their hand. I'm going to show them that a boy can do this. And so the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? (laughs) Fetch, boy. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day... 
the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines, I'm not just going for you, I'm going for your whole camp here, to the birds of the air, the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hands. Or into our hands. It will give you into our hands. And so David's word and confession went out before him. He spoke into the situation and the circumstances. Do you know why I believe Muhammad Ali was probably one of the greatest of all time boxers? He nearly spoke every time into his, into his things. I'm the greatest. I'm pretty. And I'm a bad man. I sting like a butterfly. What is it? <laughs> Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. I'm the greatest. Speaking all the time over a situation and circumstances. Imagine that. Imagine if we, especially when you have the Holy Spirit on you, the, 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 the temple of the living God speaking into your situation and circumstances. I am going to win this war against this cancer. I'm going to battle this with this health issue. I'm going to win. I'm going to see God's prosperity come to fruit in my life, even though I don't have any money in the bank and this bill's due uh, next week. I'm going to see it come to pass and I'm going to praise the living God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Speak into your situation and circumstances. And what we see here is David spoke. He prophesied. Can these bones live, son of man? And so verse, where were we at to? So 48, so it was that when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, took, the, took out the stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine into his forehead so that the stone sank into his, sank into his head. And I like adding this part and his brains burst out the back. That might be a bit of an add-on, but anyway, graphic as. Sank into his forehead, and he fell onto his face on the earth. And so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine, and he killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, and took his sword out and drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. Now, uh, Andrew Womack said, as he st stood in the valley of Elah, he says that, that there is no way that the Philistines could have known that, that Goliath had been fallen until David picked up his head and held it up like this. Your champion is dead. That's when they screamed for it, ran. And so we, what we see here in verse 51, and when the Philistines saw that the champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sharaim, even as far as Gath and Ekron. And then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents. And the Philistines uh, plundered, plundered, the tents, plundered their tents. And when David took the head of the Philistine and brought it into Jerusalem, he put his armor in his tent. And, so, and when Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, who is, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, Inquire whose son this young man is. And then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David said, I am the son of your servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. Isn't that awesome? Amen. So he held up the head of Goliath. Now David's, what differentiated here was David's knowledge and relationship of God. It kept him from seeing the situation in the right light. He knew his God. He knew what, he, he sung psalms to God all the time. Some of the, the awesomest and, and, and the most poetic psalms that we have in the Bible here were written by David. He knew who God was. He sung to him. He sung praises to God, even in his darkest hour. He, he lifted up his voice and he worshipped the Lord. And his relationship and knowledge with God kept him seeing the situation in the right light. He saw, 
what, what, the, what the Israelites saw here, they looked down and they saw this huge man. They saw this Philistine giant, a nine foot three man. Someone's going to <laughs> someone's gonna have to fight him. Who's going to take him on? Bag's not me. But David came down and he saw, who is this? There is only one guy down there. And you know what? He is still just a man. You know what's even worse is that he's defying our, our God. The, the Lord that I praise and worship and I thank him every night for, for the good things that he does in my life. That he's kept me from the lion. He's kept me from the bear. And this reproach on Israel, he'll just be like one of them. And so when problem and issues occur in our, even in our own life, doubt, fear and unbelief can creep in. And the problem is, is that we take our eyes off God and onto the situation. And that's when confusion happens. That's when we begin to lose and, and fear and unbelief begins to come in. Turn with me to um, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18. Kind of, we'll read from verse 16 so verse 16 it says therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing yet the inward man is being renewed day by day for our light affliction which is but for a moment that's eternal thinking there sometimes we think oh man this crisis is going to be too much I can't bear it anymore Lord it's over but eternal thinking says hey this, this, this thing is going to be over and done with and through and I'm still going to be here and I'm still going to be loving God is for our light affliction is but that which is for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal way of glory for while we do not look at the things which are seen but the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal you know sometimes we even pray wrong we pray the problem <laughs> yes dad we pray the problem. We complain. We sob. <laughs> oh, Lord. I've got no money. I'm having troubles with the wife. My kids hate me. Oh, God. With our eyes are fixed on the situation and circumstances, we pray wrong. Sounds like a sad country western song. <laughs> no money in the bank. Wife's left me dog sick see what we see here with David is David didn't say dear Lord this guy is so big he wears a, a chain mail weighing 35 kgs uh, uh, he's been a warrior since his, he didn't even mention Gath, the Goliath from Gath you know the psalm that they believe uh, uh, he sang before he even went to uh, uh, Gath to face Goliath was, was Psalm 23 the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he leads me beside green pastures even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. There is no mention of Goliath. There is no mention of the Philistines. There is no mention of, of, of the crisis that's at hand. It's about the Lord. You so say, David knew who his God was, and it was repugnant to him that, that his fellow countrymen had forgotten. You have forgotten who your God is you've forgotten what God has done in your life it's always good to think in hindsight you know the Jewish people there is a, a time of the year where they think in hindsight and reflect on what God's done in their life there is a time that's been set aside in the year where they just sit and they reflect on who God is that's something that we, we sorely miss in the, in the church in the western world we need to remember what God's done in our lives look where he's brought you from thus far that you're here sitting in the house now. <laughs> you are blessed, man. I, I'd hate to think where I'd be right now if I didn't know, who Je if I didn't know Jesus. Oh, gosh. And so it was a time of, of reflection. God, David knew who his God was and it was repugnant, repugnant to him that his fellow countrymen had forgotten. 
So he stood there as he looked at Goliath and he goes, bro, you're going down. I got this. You are nothing to me. And so when, when we pray, we shouldn't be praying the problem. Lord, I need this and Lord, I need that. Because you, you're fixing your eyes on the, the temporary thing that's going to be sorted out in, in the end anyway. But we magnify who he is. I just want to read this to you. This, this is Psalm 18 verses 1 to 3. And it says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise. And I am safe from my enemies. I will love you, O Lord, my God. I will love you, O Lord, my God. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my strength, and whom will I trust? My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I will be safe from my enemies. Praise the Lord. See how his eyes were fixed on eternity. And when our eyes are fixed on eternity, it differentiates you from all other people. All other people can see the situation for what it is, but you are meant to prosper. You are meant to be victorious. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, man, you are an unstoppable force. And, and you know what? Crisis is going to come. But so what? <laughs> You're just going to come out stronger at the end of it. And I think the reason why people have, have, have left the faith and have turned their back on God and turned their back on church and that is because they have forgotten some things. They have forgotten who God is. They've forgotten what he's done in their life. And when crisis comes now for them, oh, they're going to be just like every other Israelite, running in fear. But there has to be someone that's saying, I got this. I'll take it from here. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you for your word. It is health and life to us. In keeping of it, there is great, great, great reward. And I thank you. I stand in the presence of giant slayers. In Jesus' name.